Before we get into specifics of different types of models of power cycles, I want us to practice analyzing a power cycle without any established model, just an arbitrary power cycle. We have to develop a skill set to analyze power cycles in general before we get lost in the minutia of what makes up an auto cycle or a diesel cycle or a Brayton cycle. So in this problem, we are considering a cold air standard cycle with constant specific heats being executed in a closed system comprised of four processes. The process from state 1 to state 2 is isentropic compression from 100 kilopascals and 27 degrees Celsius to 800 kilopascals. The process from 2 to 3 is isochoric heat transfer, it doesn't specify in or out, which brings the temperature to 1800 Kelvin. 3 to 4 is isothermal, that's constant temperature expansion to 100 kilopascals, and 4 to 1 is isobaric heat transfer, again, without any indication of direction, which restores the system to its initial state. Using this information, I want us to determine the network and net heat transfer occurring in the cycle. So let's parse that out for a second. We have a cold air standard cycle. Air standard is referring to the fact that we are analyzing ideal air and using those same four assumptions that are grouped together under the name air standard. The cold in cold air standard implies to us that we are using constant specific heats, which is also explicitly written here. And furthermore, that those constant specific heats are evaluated at 300 Kelvin. That's what the cold refers to. Regardless of the temperature of the process, the temperature of the air, at any state point, we are evaluating the properties at 300 Kelvin. The fact that it's a closed system implies to us that the mass remains constant, so all four state points are going to have the same mass, which we can just call the mass M. And then we are looking for network and net heat transfer. We have enough information in the problem to fully define all four state points. We know that because we have two independent intensive, uh, excuse me. We know that because we have two independent intensive properties at all four state points. If we look at state one, we were told T1 and P1. Those two independent intensive properties fully define state 1, from which we can determine any other property we want. At state 2, we were told a pressure. Because 1 to 2 is isentropic compression from 100 kilopascals and 27 degrees Celsius to 800 kilopascals. That's process at 800 kilopascals. We also know that the process from 1 to 2 is isentropic. Isentropic means that the entropy is going to be constant throughout the process. So S2 will equal S1. And if we know S1, because we can look it up, because we can look up anything using T1 and P1, theoretically, then S2 being equal to S1 gives us our other independent intensive property at state 2. If we follow that same logic, the process from 2 to 3 is an isochoric process, that means constant volume, so the total volume at 3 is going to be the same as the total volume at 2. That itself is not an intensive property, but because we know it's a closed system, therefore the mass is constant, that means M3 is also going to be equal to M2, and the fact that the volume doesn't change and the mass doesn't change means that our specific volume you're not going to change. So if we use P2 and S2 to determine V2, we can fully define state 3. Last up, we were told we have isothermal expansion to 100 kilopascals. That isothermal refers to the 1800 Kelvin temperature that we had from 2 to 3. So both 3 and 4 are going to be the same temperature. T3 is 1800 Kelvin, and T4 is equal to T3. The problem also tells us that the isothermal expansion process from 3 to 4 ends at 100 kilopascals, which fully defines state 4. 
So these eight independent intensive properties fully define the four state points. And from that, the world is our oyster. We can look up whatever we want. We can theoretically calculate whatever aspects of the processes we want. To determine the net work and the net heat transfer, we are going to have to calculate all four works. That is, the work from 1 to 2, the work from 2 to 3, the work from 3 to 4, the work from 4 to 1, and all four heat transfers, 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, 4 to 1. Once we analyze all four works and heat transfers, we can assess the cycle as a whole. I'm going to start by taking our independent intensive properties that are specified and breaking them into a table. That isn't necessary, nor is it necessary to complete the table once you have it. It just happens to be a convenient way for me to organize the information in my brain. So I'm going to take the information specified and draw a table. And the three relevant independent intensive properties that I care about are temperature. Oh, let's try that again. Temperature, pressure, and specific volume. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, John, well, temperature and pressure I can get behind. Those are useful for looking stuff up or calculating heat transfers, but why the specific volume? Well, specific volume is particularly useful as a quantity in reciprocating engines. That is an engine that operates by compressing and expanding a gas inside of a piston cylinder arrangement. Now, in this problem, it doesn't explicitly say reciprocating engine, but the fact that it's a closed system implies to us that this power cycle is operating on the same mass the whole time. So there's expansion and contraction of that same mass. And it's useful to have a parameter that lets us kind of keep track of the expansion and contraction process. Plus, you know, it's good character building to add more independent intensive properties for us to keep track of. Then over here, I'm going to define these properties relative to these four state points. Let's start by plugging in what we know already. T1 is 27 degrees Celsius, which is going to be 300.15 Kelvin. Right, calculator? I mean, ah, that's fine. We don't need the calculator. Right, calculator? C. Okay. 27 plus 273.15. Hooray, it's 300.15. We did it. P1 is 100 kilopascals. V1 we don't know yet. P2 was 800 kilopascals. And we know that V2 is going to be the same as V1. So, draw an arrow or something that helps me keep track of that. State 3 we know has a temperature of 1800 because the process from 2 to 3 ends at 1800. That's not temperature, John. There we go. 1800. And then the process from 3 to 4 is also isothermal, which means that 3 to 4 is constant temperature. I'll draw my arrow, you know, just to provide some consistency in this table that I'm drawing. So we don't know V1, which means that we can't set up our two quantitative properties at state 2 to determine whatever else we want. So let's think about that for a second. How could we use T1 and P1 to determine a specific volume? Well, you're probably going to be thinking property tables. Property tables for air, I look up T1 and P1 and I determine a specific volume. Well, that's a good instinct, but in our particular appendices, we don't have properties for air that include an actual specific volume. And why don't we? Because those tables are for ideal air, and for ideal air, we have a better way of coming up with specific volume that doesn't waste a whole bunch of ink. We know that it is going to be R times T over P, because it's an ideal gas, and therefore, we're going to be using the ideal gas law to keep track of it. 
So specific volume can be written as the specific gas constant for air multiplied by T1 divided by P1, and that would give us specific volume. Furthermore, remember that the specific gas constant for air is going to be the universal gas constant divided by the molar mass of air. Those quantities can be determined in the textbook, and in fact, why don't we just look up the specific heat capacities while we're at it? So I am going to clear some space here. So I'm going to say ideal air at 300 Kelvin. We want, presumably, some combination of CP, CV, and K, because it's specific heat capacity. And let's look up a molar mass of air. And let's use the universal gas constant the molar mass of air to determine a specific gas constant. So, into our tables, let us adventure. We know from the inside of the front cover of our textbook that the universal gas constant is 8.314 kilojoules per kilomole Kelvin. So that's going to be 8.314 kilojoules per kilomole Kelvin. And then next, let's grab the molar mass of air just so we can calculate the specific gas constant. That's going to come from table A1 which is going to be 28.97 kilomoles cancel which results in a quantity in kilojoules per kilogram kelvin let's wake the calculator up and have it spit out 0 0.287 for us Hey look, it's 0.287-ish. So 0 0.286987, which I'm going to round to 7. And then... Nope, John, you can't talk and write at the same time. Kilograms per kilomole, not kilograms per kilogram. Ah. CP, CV, and K will all come from our specific heat capacity tables for ideal air. So let's peruse on down to, I believe it's table A19. And we can see that it is not table A19. It is, in fact, table A20. So table A20 gives us CP, CV, and K values for air, that is ideal air, at different temperatures. Now which temperature do we use? That's right, we use 300. And it's not because T1 is 300, it is because we were told to use the cold air standard, which means we're evaluating these properties at 300 Kelvin. That is what the cold in cold air standard means. There's also a hot air standard where you look up properties at, I think it's 600 degrees Celsius, but that's, don't quote me, that's off the top of my head. So 1.005, 0 0.718, and 1 1.4. That's 1.005 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. 0 0.718 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. And 1.4. And note that every time that we use the cold air standard, we are going to be using these same three properties. So you're going to get very proficient at looking them up. And at a certain point, you can just start grabbing them from memory. That's fine as long as you know where they come from. I should be able to give you a problem on the exam that's, I don't know, of nitrogen or oxygen, and you should be able to determine the CP and CV and K values and not just default to the ones that you've been using out of muscle memory. So now that we have an, a specific gas constant, we can calculate a specific volume at state one. So 0 0.287, big horizontal line, kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, 
and we are multiplying by 300 Kelvin. 300.15 because it was 27 degrees Celsius. We are dividing by 100 kilopascals, which was the pressure at state one. And so far, Kelvin cancels Kelvin. To get the rest of the units to cancel appropriately, I need to break the pressure and energy units into their primary components. I could do that by breaking a kilopascal into a thousand kilo... Oh, here, I'll just show you. So I could break a kilopascal into a thousand pascals and break a kilojoule into a thousand joules, but when I do that, I just cancel the thousands anyway. So in these circumstances, it's uh, actually more convenient to just leave it in the thousands quantity. So a kilopascal could be written as kilonewton per square meter, as opposed to a thousand pascals, and then a pascal is a newton per square meter. Just fewer steps to write. And then a kilojoule can be written as a thousand joules. Now, kilojoule cancels kilojoules. Kilonewtons cancels kilonewtons. John. We talked about this. The whole point was to leave it in the thousands quantity. What are you doing? Kilonewtons cancels kilonewtons. Kilojoules still cancels kilojoules. Kilopascals cancels kilopascals. That leaves me with square meters and meters, which is going to be cubic meters and kilograms in the denominator. So, calculator, if you would wake up. We are going to be taking 0 0.287 multiplied by 300.15 and dividing that by 100 and we get about 0 0.861 cubic meters per kilogram. So I'll write that here, 0 0.861. And then because of the arrow, because we have enough information to give us our quantity at state 2. Interesting. I didn't write the arrow in the right spot. Guys, you're supposed to yell at your TVs. Okay, let's try that again. Because we have enough information to fully define state 2 around state 1, we have the ability to determine our other properties. Now, how is it that we get T2 and V2? You might be tempted to say the ideal gas law again, but we could only do that if we had another property at state two. We don't. So the ideal gas law itself isn't going to be useful. Now we could use our ability to look up some representations of entropy and use our knowledge of what isentropic means to determine another property at state two using our ideal gas tables. But remember, we're analyzing a problem that has constant specific heats. Furthermore, we are analyzing an isentropic process with constant specific heats and the working fluid is an ideal gas. Do those three assumptions sound familiar? They should. Those three assumptions are what it takes to use the isentropic ideal gas relations. I know, it is very exciting. Remember that all four rows of these equations are actually the same. It's just that I don't want to rely on my ability to do algebra in my head and as a result, I have solved each row relative to a different parameter. So row one is solved for temperature, row two is solved for pressure, row three is solved for volume, row four is solved for density, even though the last two rows are the same, I feel as though I have to complete all four properties. So here we are. We can use any equation on this sheet to refer to properties from state one to state two because it's isentropic and it's an ideal gas with constant specific heats, but this only works for process 1 to 2, it doesn't work for the process 2 to 3, 3 to 4, or 4 to 1. So, if we were to grab this one, for example, we could say T2 is equal to T1 times P2 over P1 raised to the K minus 1 over K. So I could say T2 is equal to T1 multiplied by P2 over P1 raised to the K minus 1 over K. T1 we know, it's 300.15 Kelvin. P2 over P1 is 800 over 100, K is 1.4. We have everything we need to calculate T2. So, 300.15 multiplied by 800 divided by 100 raised to the power of 1.4 minus 1 
divided by 1.4. Our T2 is 543.706. And for completion's sake, I'm going to round it to two decimal places. We can follow that same logic for the specific volume of state 2, jumping back to this set of equations and recognizing that if I divide the numerator and denominator by mass in, say, this equation, I can write that as specific volume 2 is equal to specific volume 1 multiplied by P1 over P2 raised to the 1 over K. So, same logic. I'm taking 0 0.86139 multiplied by 1, excuse me, yeah, 100 over 800 because it's P1 over P2 raised to the power of 1 over 1.4. And we get 0 0.195. So let's pause on that for a moment. Does it make sense that our specific volume went down? Yes, it does, because we have a compression process. It's a compression process, which means that it should be taking up less volume. It's the same mass, therefore the specific volume should be decreasing as a result of the compression process. So it totally makes sense that our specific volume went down. Does it make sense that our temperature went up? Yes, because we are compressing the gas isentropically. We are increasing the temperature as a result of pushing all the molecules together. Now, specific volume 2 is equal to specific volume 3 because of the arrow. It's totally right this time. Double check that it says ISO core from 2 to 3. It does. Now we have temperature and specific volume. So how do we get pressure? This time around, we're going to use our ideal gas law equation again. Now we could do this in one of two ways. We could say pressure is equal to specific gas constant times temperature divided by specific volume. We could plug in T3 and V3 and output P3. We could also recognize that because specific volume is constant from 2 to 3 and the constant gas constant is also constant, I could write these two constants on one side of the equation and then V over R, that quantity is the same at state 2 as it is at state 3, so I could write, oh, that'd be T over P. See, algebra in my head doesn't work out. T2 over P2 is equal to T3 over P3. Therefore, P3 would be equal to P2 multiplied by the quantity T3 over T2. Again, either method works. I prefer this one because it is fewer steps. So I'm going to take 800 and I'm going to multiply by 1800 divided by 543.706 and I get 2648.5 that gives me enough information to move on to state 4 the process from 3 to 4 is isothermal expansion to 100 kilopascals so I didn't write 100 when I was populating the information I already knew. So, knowing P3 doesn't particularly help me in P4. I already had P4. I guess there's a lesson to be learned there. Sometimes, what you need is inside the problem statement all along. T4 and P4 can be used to determine specific volume in the same way as we did for state 1. We could say V4 is equal to R times T4 over P4. We could also use the isobaric process from 4 to 1 to write out the ideal gas law as R over P is equal to V over T. Therefore, V4 could be written as T4. V over T is equal to T4 times, okay. I can't, can't do algebra. V4 or T4? We go to V1 or T1. Yeah, it's fine. So T4 times V4 over T1. So I could calculate that as 
1800 over 300.15 multiplied by why are you there you should be one multiplied by 0 0.861 so just for funsies here let's do it both ways so i am taking let's go down slightly t4 that's 1800 divided by t1 which is 300.15 and we are multiplying by 0 0.86139 and we get 5.16576 5 5.16 I can probably stop let's go 166 everything else was three decimal places in the specific volume column so I'll let it be and then could also write it as v4 is equal to r times t4 over p4 so for good measure we will check our work by writing 0 0.287 ish multiplied by our t4 which was 1800 divided by our p4 which was 100 and we get 5.166 as well excellent we now have all four temperatures pressures and specific volumes and even though that wasn't explicitly asked for in the problem even though that's partially a waste of time if I'm calculating additional properties that I don't necessarily need on an exam, for example, it is useful as a way of kind of practicing through the process of taking two properties at one state point and a process to a single property at a second state point and then using the information you know about the process to get to the other property at the second state point. You should be able to do this for any of the problems that we're working in chapter nine, even if you don't necessarily have to. That skill set doesn't go away. If you need a property, you can determine it. Anyway, I'll get rid of my arrows just because they haunt me of that blunder I made earlier. And I will clear up some space here. So next, we can use these four temperature, pressure, and specific volume properties to help us determine a work and heat transfer for all four processes. So what I want now is the heat transfer from one to two, the heat transfer from two to three, the heat transfer from three to four, and the heat transfer from four to one. Furthermore, I want the work from one to two, I want the work from two to three. I want the work from three to four. And I want the work from four to one. I want a magnitude and direction for each of these eight quantities. Let's start with the easy ones. An isentropic process is going to be adiabatic. We know that because we are saying delta S of our system is added to the delta s of the surroundings to equal zero because it's an isentropic process the entropy doesn't change and there is no generated entropy which means that this being constant and that being constant must give us zero here so the heat transfer from one to two is zero done the other easy one is going to be the isochoric work because since we're expanding and contracting a closed system, the relevant work here is going to be boundary work, which means that our work from two to three is zero. Then our process from one to two is going to have some amount of work as a result. Process from two to three is going to have some amount of heat transfer as a result. Process from three to four is going to have both work and heat transfer. Process from 4 to 1 is also going to have both work and heat transfer. That makes sense. So, start with 1 to 2. How do we get the work, you ask? Well, let's consider an energy balance. Our energy balance from 1 to 2 is of an isentropic compression process. So I'm talking about the worst drawing ever. Okay, I gotta redo that.
I'm talking about compressing the gas without allowing it to exchange any heat. So I'm going to start with delta E is equal to En minus E out. I recognize that it is a closed system, which means that the heat transfer and work would be my only two opportunities for energy to cross the boundary. And then it's a transient process, which means the left-hand side of the equation matters. So delta U plus delta KE plus delta PE. Then I can begin to simplify for the actual problem at hand. I have no heat transfer occurring. It's a compression process, which means that work is only going to be in the inward direction. And I'm assuming no changes in kinetic or potential energy of the system itself. Which means the work in is going to be simplified down to just delta U. Which I could write as big U2 minus big U1. Or I could write as mass 2 times little u2 minus mass 1 times little u1. And because it's a closed system, the mass doesn't change, therefore the mass comes out. And I could write that as mass times little u2 minus little u1. Note that up here, I wrote specific work. That's not total work, that's specific work. The reason I did that was because I have no indication as to a size of this engine. I was just told enough properties to be able to analyze it on a an intensive basis so I don't actually have any ability to involve mass. I don't know the mass, I don't know enough information to involve the mass, therefore anything that I do is going to be relative to the amount of mass. It's going to be expressed per unit mass, it's going to be a specific quantity. So I want specific work in from 1 to 2, that's equal to total work in here divided by mass, which is just little u2 minus little u1. Cool. At this point, I could take T1 and look up u1 using my ideal gas tables. I think that's table A22. I could use T2 to look up u2 and I could subtract them, but because it's a cold air standard problem, I'm assuming constant specific heats, which means I'm going to substitute for delta u. Quick question. Do I use CV or CP? Correct. It is indeed CV. Remember that I define, define, <laughs> I define my CV as my the UDT term for ideal gases, which because we are assuming it's constant, is going to be deltas. I can say DU is equal to CV DT, integrate both sides. CV comes out of the integral because it's constant. I have delta U is equal to CV times delta T. If it had been a problem involving enthalpy, I would have been using the HDT, and therefore it would be more useful for me to write a specific heat capacity term that involves enthalpy. Again, it would come out because it's constant, and I would have delta T is equal to CP times delta T. Nope. Yeah, that's what is happening. So instead of writing little u2 minus little u1, I'm going to, going to write Cv times T2 minus T1. Cv we looked up is 0 0.718 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. And T2 and T1 are known. It's 543.71 and 300. So... Calculator, if you would please, 0 0.718 multiplied by 543.71 minus 300.15, and we get 174.873. And that's the work in to the process from 1 to 2. So... I'll probably round that when I write it above, but 
leave it there for now. So the work in to is 174.8488, excuse me, and that is in the inward direction. Process one to two done. The process from two to three is going to look much the same at the beginning. So we'll denote this as one to two. I'll do two to three. Copy it down for good measure. We have a closed system, which means that energy can cross the boundary is heat or work. It's a transient process, which means that I have to include the left-hand side of the equation. My diagram is going to be a little bit different this time because the piston isn't moving. It's an isochoric process. We were just told that we have heat transfer. Now, it doesn't actually matter which direction we analyze the heat transfer for the purposes of the energy balance because if we get a negative number at the end, that means we chose in our direction incorrectly. So in some cases, it might be useful to just always call it an in or an out and then just use the positive and negative to inform what you're doing. For my purposes here, though, I don't need to just arbitrarily pick a direction to analyze because I can deduce the direction of the heat transfer. I have an isochoric process. The volume remains the same where heat transfer occurs and the temperature goes from 543 to 1800. The temperature increases, which means the energy increases, which means I'm probably adding heat to the system. So I'm going to leave that as a Q in term. And again, if I get a negative number at the end of my calculation, that just means I was wrong about the direction specifically and nothing else probably. So Q in is equal to delta U this time. So little Q in is going to be big Q in divided by mass, which is going to be little u3 minus little u2, because again, this process is from 2 to 3. So end minus beginning would be u3 minus u2. And I'll make the same substitution as earlier, which was Cv times T3 minus T2. So I will say 0 0.718 multiplied by T3, which is 1800, minus 543.7, and then a bunch of decimals. So we get negative two. Oh, right, I wrote 180. I was like, what? <clears throat> really? Calculator? Okay, let's try that again. <clears throat> we got a positive number, which we totally knew was going to happen the whole time. 902 is going to be our heat transfer in from 2 to 3. And I'm going to copy that up here. It's heat transfer from 2 to 3 of 902. And I'll round to two decimal places. Kilojoules per kilogram in the inward direction. Two processes done. For three to four, I have isothermal expansion. Why did I copy the table? No one knows. So let's copy this this time. Put that down here. And we are going from three to four this time. Three to four, and we have an isothermal expansion process. Going from three to four, and that is going to affect what we cancel. Let's go back to this step. Transient process. 
and closed system. Expansion, temperature remains the same for the gas. So, which work do we leave? Well, it's an expansion process, which is going to be work in the outward direction. Close cancel work in. Now, what about heat transfer? Do we cancel it or do we leave it? I'll give you a sec. Well, you're tempted to say we cancel the heat transfers, but your temptation to do that is ill-advised. If you have an isothermal process, that means the temperature remains the same. That does not mean there's no heat transfer. In fact, for the process to occur with a constant temperature, there's probably going to be more heat transfer than there would have been otherwise. I mean, think about it. If you're expanding something, its natural tendency is going to be to try to cool down. So in order to maintain a constant temperature, there must be heat coming in from the outside to hold that temperature constant. Does that make sense? So as a result of this expansion process, I probably have a heat transfer in. So I'm going to cancel Q out, and again, if I get a negative number, that means I chose incorrectly. Now what about delta U? I mean, right now, I have delta U is equal to Q in minus work out. And yes, I could do the same thing that I've done the last couple of times. I could write that as mass times little u3, excuse me, little u4 minus little u3. And then I could divide everything by mass, at which point I would have delta little u. That was an interesting scroll. I could have delta little u, u4 minus u3 is equal to little q in minus little workout. Again, that's what happens when you divide everything by mass. But u3 and u4 are going to be the same. Because for an ideal gas, the internal energy is only a function of temperature. I mean, think about if I plug in Cv times T4 minus T3 here. T3 and T4 are both 1800 Kelvin. 1800 minus 1800 is zero. Zero times the number is still zero. So this entire quantity is zero. Therefore, work out is going to equal Qn. We have one equation and two unknowns which means the energy balance alone isn't going to be enough. I have to involve something else to calculate the heat transfer or the work. So again, I'll give you a minute. Can you think of any way that we could calculate the work or the heat transfer without using the energy balance? The relevant type of work here is boundary work. And we have a definition for boundary work. Boundary work is defined as being the integral of pressure with respect to volume. We can use an expression for pressure, like, for example, pressure times specific volume is equal to gas constant times temperature. Therefore, pressure as a function of volume is equal to gas constant times temperature divided by specific volume. Therefore, I could write this as the integral of R times T over specific volume times D volume could bring out the gas constant and the temperature, at which point I'd be left with a natural log. I would actually probably want to write this in terms of total volume instead of specific volume, but dividing everything by mass gets rid of the total volume, in, instead gets specific volume anyway. So I would have RT times the natural log of V evaluated from V3 to V4. So I would say R times T times the quantity of natural log of V4 minus the natural log of V3, which because of natural log rules, I can write that as R times T times the natural log of V4 over V3. The temperature is constant, so it doesn't matter if I plug in 3 or 4, it's 1800 Kelvin. The specific gas constant I evaluated already, that's a 0 0.287 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, and V4 and V3 I happen to have already. I know the numbers because I calculated them, even though at the time it seemed like extra work for nothing. So calculator, come back. We have 0 0.287 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin multiplied by 1800 Kelvin. That's going to cancel the Kelvins, which is going to leave me with kilojoules per kilogram. And then I'm multiplying by a natural log, which I don't have a convenient button for in this calculator emulator, so I'm going to write that as natural log and then 
divided by 0 0.195 and I get 1692.82 and the natural log is going to produce a unitless quantity so kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin multiplied by Kelvin it's going to yield kilojoules per kilogram multiplied by a unitless proportion, which is just going to be kilojoules per kilogram in my end result. So the boundary work, the specific boundary work occurring in this process is 1692.82 kilojoules per kilogram. That's going to be a work output because it's positive. Remember that we define boundary work as being in the outward direction because our dv term here is positive for the case of expansion. Therefore, the work out in this process and the heat transfer in for this process are both 1692.82. I will go write that down. Heat transfer in 1692.82 kilojoules per kilogram. And that would be in the inward direction. And our workout is also 1692.82. This time in the outward direction. By the way, that boundary work equation would have allowed us to calculate 1 and 2 without involving the delta U relationship. I could have used the specific boundary work from 1 to 2. That's going to be an isentropic process, which means I'm going to use the polytric form. That'd be P2 v2 minus p1 v1 divided by 1 minus n and we are plugging in k in place of n so i could say p2 times v2 minus p1 times v1 divided by 1 minus 1 1.4 but i'm going to be even lazier than that instead of plugging in pressures in specific volumes i'm going to recognize that pressure times specific volume is gas constant times temperature because of the ideal gas law which means I can write that as R times T2 over T1 so I can say 0 0.287 multiplied by T2 which was 543.70591565 minus T1 which is 300.15 and divide that by 1 minus 1 1.4 and I get negative 174.751 so the boundary work the work output from 1 to 2 is negative 174.75 which means that my work in would actually have been 170.75 so I got 174.88 I think 174.75 is within enough rounding errors in the calculation itself to be the same as 174.88? Yeah, probably. And again, we could do that for the process from 2 to 3 as well. I guess 2 to 3 would be boring. Not particularly helpful. Body work is zero. So we can't involve that to be useful in the process from 2 to 3. Okay, armed with all of this skill set, let's go back to analyzing one process at a time. In 4 to 1, my energy balance is going to start off the same. I'm going to have a simplification for the closed system. Energy can cross the boundary is heat and work. And I'm going to draw a little diagram. I have heat transfer, but I wasn't told which direction, so I will have to think about it. I'm going from a large specific volume to a small specific volume, which means that I'm likely going to be compressing as a result of the heat transfer. to 1, 
and then from 4 to 1, as it's cooling and maintaining a constant pressure, I'm likely going to have heat transfer in the outward direction. I know that because the temperature is dropping from 1800 to 300.15. So I'm going to call my work in from 4 to 1. And I'm going to call my heat transfer out. And can I get rid of delta U? No, I can't. That means I have to use delta U is equal to work in minus U out. So in the process from 1 to 2, I had delta U and work in. I got rid of Q. In the process from 2 to 3, I got rid of work. In the process from 3 to 4, I got rid of delta U. This time, I have to consider all three at the same time. Ooh. That means I'm going to be using three equations to solve for these three unknowns. The equation for delta U is going to be CV times T1 minus T4. The equation for work in is going to be negative boundary work. That's going to be easy because it's the integral of pressure with respect to specific volume and the pressure comes out because I have a constant pressure process from 4 to 1, which means this is just pressure times our relationship between specific volume, which is going to be V1 minus V4. So the pressure at 4 is 100 kilopascals. I know both specific volumes. I could do the same thing I did earlier, by the way. I could substitute in R times T1 minus T4. If I wanted to, that would be perfectly valid. That might be more convenient in this, this case, because theoretically I'm solving for Q out by rearranging the equation, writing it as work in minus delta u. So I could say r times t1 minus t4, except negated, so it'd be r times t4 minus t1 because of this negative sign. r times t4 minus t1 minus cv times t1 minus t4. Did you follow all that? Okay, good. So I will say 0 0.287. And I will write times T4 minus T1. So 1800 minus 300.15, and that gives me 430. It's positive, which means that I guessed correctly in my directionality. 430.46, 430.46. And then our heat transfer is going to be 430.46 minus CV times T1 minus T4 minus 0 0.718 times 300.15 minus 1800. And I get 1507. So, 1507.35 kilojoules per kilogram in the outward direction. And with that, I have all four heat transfers and works. Then determining the net work is just going to be a combination of the works. Determining the net heat transfer is going to be the combination of the heat transfers. I have 902.02 plus 1692.82 heat transfer in the inward direction, which means I have more heat transfer in than out, which means I'm going to have a net heat transfer in the inward direction. Q net in is equal to Q in minus Q out. 
which is going to be the heat transfer from 2 to 3 plus the heat transfer from 3 to 4 minus the heat transfer from 4 to 1. So 902.02 plus 1692.82 minus 1507.35. And I get 1087.49. And then the network is presumably going to be in the outward direction because it is a power cycle after all. But just to double check, 174.88 is in, 430.46 is in combined. That's, I don't know, about 600. 1692.82 in the outward direction is still bigger than that. Therefore, I'm going to have a network in the outward direction. So network out is going to be the outs. That's only work from three to four minus the ins, which is the work from 1 to 2, plus the work from 4 to 1. So 1692.82 minus 174.88 plus 430.46. So I am going to get 1087.48. Now remember, this cycle is itself a closed system. And it's operating steadily when you consider an entire cycle at a time. So it has to get back to where it started every time. So my net work out should equal my net heat transfer in because the energy doesn't have the opportunity to do anything else. So I should have gotten the exact same number for both. I'm going to chalk up the differences in the hundreds place to the fact that I rounded all of these numbers to the one hundreds place. Presumably if you kept track of your decimals a little bit more carefully, you would have gotten exactly the same number for both. Cool. That's all we actually had to do for the problem statement as written. But since we're here, let's do some more. Let's say I had asked us for the thermal efficiency of this power cycle. Well, that is a common parameter that we use to evaluate relative performance. And remember that thermal efficiency is our desired effect of our power cycle, which is the net workout, divided by what you put in to make that happen. In the case of a power cycle, what we are putting in is heat transfer. That's why we call it thermal efficiency. It's efficiency relative to the heat added. So that's QN. Remember, don't use net QN, otherwise you should get a 100% efficient turbine, every, excuse me, power cycle every single time. We only want the heat transfer in. So I'm going to take 1087.48 kilojoules per kilogram and divide it by the heat transfer in the inward direction. There are two sources of heat transfer in, so I'm going to divide by 1692.82 plus 902.02. .02. And I get a thermal efficiency of 41.9%. That's a shame. I'd written it to hit 42. Curse you rounding errors. So about 42% efficient. Anything else we can do while we're here? Well, how about for fun? Let's draw the PV and TS diagrams. So I want graphs for pressure with respect to specific volume and temperature with respect to entropy. These graphs are useful for keeping track of what's happening in a cycle. The PV diagram is going to give us an idea of the work that's happening because movement to the left or right is going to represent work. The TS diagram is going to give us an idea of what heat transfer is happening because movement to the left or right on the TS diagram represents heat transfer out. As a result, looking at the PV and TS diagrams can help us keep track of what's actually happening and consider the operation of the cycle as a whole. So, movement to the right on the PV diagram represents work out, movement to the left represents work in. On the TS diagram, it's the opposite. Movement to the left 
represents heat transfer out because of Beyonce. Movement to the right represents heat transfer in. Now we could actually use our pressures and specific volumes to plot this to scale, but I don't necessarily want that. What I want for these sorts of drawings is just a relative idea of what's happening. I don't need it to be drawn to scale, I just want the positioning of the state points relative to one another to make sense. So let's start by considering what's happening on the x-axis for the specific volume on the PV diagram. Well, if movement to the left and right represents work, then I should be able to look at the works and heat transfers and deduce what's happening based on the input or output of work. From work, from one to two I have in, three to four I have out, four to one I have in. So from one to two I'm going to move to the left, and then I'm going to stay there from two to three. And then I'm going to move to the right from three to four, and I'm going to move back to the left to get back to where I started. So one is going to be in the middle, two and three are going to be to the left, and four is going to be to the right. Again, because I have work in from one to two, I have no work from two to three, so there's no horizontal displacement. I have work out from three to four, and then I have work in again to get back to where we started. You should be able to use this reasoning to build a PV and TS diagram even if you don't have these specific properties. So yes, we totally could have looked at this and gone 0 0.861 is state 1, 0 0.195 is less than that, that's state 2 and 3, and 5.166 is state 4. But I want you to be able to think through these. That's why they're useful, after all. The pressures themselves, though, I might as well grab. 100, 800, 2650. I'm going to grab 100 and 800 and about 2650. Draw a tiny tilde there. That doesn't help. Okay. About 2650. And these pressures are in kilopascals. So state one is going to be here. State two is going to be at 800 kilopascals. So it'll be here. State three will be up here. State four will be down here. And eventually we might get to the point where I ask you to draw these curves for the processes a little bit more accurately. But for now, you can just connect them with straight lines if you want. I know that should have a curve. Like this. So work in from 4 all the way to 2. You can think of the work in as the area under this curve. Work out from three to four, which would be the area under this entire curve. And then the region enclosed is going to be the network. And because the work out is higher, there's more area, it's going to be a network in the outward direction. Okay, one graph down. Let's do the same thing for heat transfer. So we have heat transfer in from two to three and three to four, and heat transfer out from four to one. And horizontal displacement on the TS diagram represents heat transfer. And outward heat transfer is movement to the left, inward is to the right. So from 1 to 2, I stay where I am horizontally. Then 2 to 3, I move to the right. And then 3 to 4, I move to the right. And then 4 to 1, I move back to the left to get back to where I started. So I'm going to have three locations. 1 and 2, 3, 4, and 1. Does that make sense? You don't move because there's no heat transfer from 1 to 2. 2 to 3 is movement to the, to the right because it's heat transfer in. 3 to 4 is movement to the right because it's heat transfer in. And then 4 to 1 is movement to the left and it gets us all the way back to where we started. I could also use the relative magnitudes of these heat transfers to place 3 relative to 4 a little bit more intentionally. But for now, all I want is general shape. Then again, because we have the temperatures, we might as well just use them. 300, 543. 
and 1800. And those are in Kelvin. So one and two. Three and four are up here. Straight line. And I'll draw this a straight line. And there are our PB and TS diagrams. Just like the PB diagram, I can look at the TS diagram and deduce what's happening with the heat transfer. I can see that there's heat transfer in from 2 to 3. That's going to be the area under this curve. Heat transfer in from 3 to 4. That's the area under this line. And then heat transfer out from 4 to 1. That's the area under this curve. And the heat transfer in on a net basis is the region enclosed. Okay. Now let's really be done with the problem. Now that we have that skill set, we can actually think through models of more realistic power cycles. And as we develop these models, like the auto cycle and the diesel cycle and the Brayton cycle and the Atkinson cycle and the Sterling cycle and the Erickson cycle, remember that those sets of assumptions that go along with it are on top of our skill set for analyzing a power cycle in general. You should be able to solve through the processes and the state points without getting into what it is that makes up the auto cycle or the diesel cycle or the Brayton cycle. Does that logic make sense? Don't get too lost in the minutiae of those specific assumptions that are layered on top of this analysis.